Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, actually. Thank you very much. I've got to thank the Creative Summit for having me and everyone here for coming to listen to me speak. I am not texting while I present to you. This is controlling the PowerPoint. So uh, I am the CEO of Aerocine. Many people, of course, know me for my work in 3D as the CEO of 21st Century 3D. I've developed a number of stereoscopic technologies and systems. Uh, we were the first to create an integral 3D camera well before Panasonic and Sony, and it remains the world's smallest and lightest uncompressed raw recording camera recorder. It also innovated technologies like optical uh, horizontal image translation, which we've won a Lumiere Award for, and is now an industry standard and is uh, in every broadcast 3D camera made by Panasonic and Sony. Many people know me as a guy who has innovated technologies for Steadicam and a variety of innovative 3D technologies, including the quarter wave retarder, which many of our friends and competitors around the world are using to improve the optical performance of beam splitters. Many people, of course, know me for my personal contributions and technological contributions to films like The Amazing Spider-Man, Metallica Through the Never, X-Men Days of Futures Past, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, IMAX films with Jean-Jacques and Francois Mantello, and uh, numerous 3Net television shows. And of course, people also know me as a guy who is constantly tinkering with technology and integrating things in ways that people say would be impossible. Uh, this is an industrial automation robot turned motion control platform created by our friends at Bot and Dolly in San Francisco. And this is the platform that was utilized on gravity, I should say the motion control platform that was utilized on gravity to create a lot of the zero G effects. And it was commonly con uh, thought by basically everyone, including Bot and Dolly, that it would be impossible to integrate a traditional 3D beam splitter on this incredibly active motion control platform. But of course, you can see right there, 21st century 3D BX 3.5 with two phantom mirrors. So doing things that people consider impossible is something that I'm quite well known for. Uh, and many people also know me as a guy who is integrating a lot of different 3D camera systems and helicopters in a variety of ways. This is a photograph from about 2006, possibly earlier. Uh, that's me with Nelson Tyler. Nelson Tyler invented the Tyler mount, which uh, for many, many years was the de facto standard for aerial cinematography. And that's a hyper-stereoscopic uncompressed system that we created for a project with uh, Jeff Kleiser. But I'm possibly best known for my modesty. <laughs> but of course, I'm not here to talk about 21st century 3D. As a matter of fact, most of us are aware that the live action stereoscopic motion picture production business has recently been in a tight spot. And sadly, like many of us, I've been forced to consider, well, what else would I do? So many of my friends and colleagues have said, oh, well, you know, Jason, just go shoot 2D. <clears throat> of course, I've considered this, but 2D sucks. So it's not that interesting to me. And I began, you know, well, maybe I should go to culinary school. What should I do? And I looked back at my career and I realized I've actually been involved in aerial cinematography for over 15 years. And I've done it on a variety of different productions, in a variety of different helicopter configurations, with a wide range of camera configurations, and for many, many years. Each of these represents a different camera configuration, a different helicopter. Strangely, they're mostly blue. I don't know why that is. There's Jeff Kleiser right there with the hyperstereoscopic system that we created. We've used nose mount systems from Tyler. We've had uh, uncompressed camera systems that we've developed. This is, uh, this is another Tyler, this is a Tyler middle mount with a uh, red 1MX system. This was utilized on Light the Wick. Of course, we've worked with our friends at Pictrovision and the Eclipse nose mount system. Here we've got two red 1MXs uh, and some ingenue zooms. This was utilized on Air Racers, the IMAX film uh, with uh, 3D Entertainment. And uh, just another shot of the Eclipse. You can see it's quite a bit of equipment. And there's great expense, obviously, involved in shooting from a helicopter. Uh, as a cinematographer and stereographer, however, my biggest concern with shooting from a helicopter is the danger factor. Um, this is uh, a sequence shot 
probably on my cell phone from inside the helicopter on Light the Wick. And you can see we are very close to the mountain in the helicopter. Uh, I've, I've heard my fair share of altitude alarms in helicopters, and I'm not interested in hearing too many more of those. I'll give you another view. I apologize for the low quality mobile phone video. This is someone standing on the mountain. That's us in the helicopter and light the wick. So a couple of wind gusts, and it could be a bad day. Many years ago, when uh, the AR drone came out, which was a $200 toy, basically, it's a uh, micro helicopter platform controlled by the iPhone, I got very interested in this. And here's a short clip recorded from the AR drone uh, in my home in Los Angeles. And I would reiterate that I am not the pilot for AeroCine. I am the CEO. <laughs> and this platform is very difficult to control and really not, nothing more than a toy. Uh, you can see my confusion in operating the controls there, and it's not the best cinematography anybody's ever seen, but it's a funny little clip. Those, those bananas are a little too ripe. But um, it became clear to me that this micro aerial platform had a tremendous future, and so we formed Aerocine. Aerocine is a new micro aerial cinematography company. But we're not just a bunch of guys flying around Canon 5Ds or Red Epics with lightweight lenses and things like that. The goal of Aerocine is to eliminate the perceived limitations of micro aerial platforms for cinematography. We've been flying stereoscopic Red Epics with ultra prime lenses. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a world exclusive video later of some of the other camera configurations we've been flying. And uh, we are really, really excited about this platform. We do believe we have the world's most powerful micro hexacopter. We're able to fly these payloads of up to 20 pounds, maybe 10 kilograms, something like that, for 10 and a half minutes. Now, I am aware that a, a video that we posted several weeks ago on YouTube that's gone somewhat viral has sort of set the stereoscopic micro aerial world on fire. And there are a number of people uh, challenging what we're doing and attempting to do the same thing. And uh, you know, in response to that, I would say this is not rocket science. It's pretty close, but you know, we haven't split the atom or you know invented something new here. We are just a bunch of guys who have been working on this for a long time, selecting the best platform, the best motors. We've done everything to uh, modify the rotor configuration and just tweak this thing out to the utmost extent. Uh, now, this is one little world exclusive piece of video I'd like to share with you. We've been working with ARRI CSC, which is ARRI in New York. And uh, at the end of February, we flew an Alexa XT. And this is some video footage from that. Now, this actually wasn't even the perfect configuration. We had a lot of extra equipment on there. We just basically showed up at ARRI, loaded up an Alexa XT. We didn't have the right power adapter, so there was additional weight on there. And uh, we got an 11 minute and four second flight with an, Electra, an Alexa XT and a CP2 lens. So we're pretty confident that we can extend that flight time. We're going to be trying uh, master primes on this configuration, anamorphic lenses on this configuration. We've decided that we're going to create a platform where the top cinematographers in the world no longer have to feel restricted by micro aerial cinematography and to alleviate the danger and the huge expense. Um, it's important to note that crafts like these aren't necessarily replacements for traditional helicopters. They can be in certain instances, but it's really a new platform that allows you to create shots that you just were not able to create without this type of platform. Um, I'm going to run a DCP in a moment. We've got just a few more interesting maneuvers here from the Alexa. And you can see the level of excitement, the level of excitement that was generated among the entire staff at CSC. We had basically everyone out in the parking lot, the CEO, all the sales reps, all the technicians. People were legitimately enthusiastic about seeing the Alexa fly for the first time in history on a micro aerial platform. Um, so what I want to show now, and I need to ask everyone, including uh, the guys shooting for the summit, to please just do not videotape or record on your cell phone or record in any way the next footage that I am about to show. Um, let's roll the DCP. Thank you. 
Thank you. So no one has ever had access like that to the Chernobyl site, and we're super excited about that footage. We're, we're planning to roll that into a larger uh, feature or at least one-hour documentary about uh, everything that's gone on there, the, uh, the uh, environmental disaster, obviously the, the scientific aspect, and there are a tremendous amount of human stories, obviously. So that is my presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to open up the floor. Carol's question actually raised an, an excellent point. Um, another aspect of micro aerial that is so fascinating is that the rotor wash from the micro helicopter is just fractional compared to that of a real helicopter. And it just, it allows us access to things and shots that you just wouldn't have. And you got a better feel for what the rotor wash is actually like inside the Chernobyl site in that dusty room. So there is, obviously, that effect is present, but it's a fraction of what it would be with a traditional helicopter. On Light the Wick, the professional skiers were actually in danger. We were so close to them that the rotor wash was affecting their ability to perform the stunts. So that was a hugely dangerous production that uh, I would never do something like that again. Yeah? So, me again. Um, you have one operator, we have two operators, one on the camera, one operator in the helicopter. For the inside of the building, did, did you have to have line of sight or were you happy enough to just fly it in and out? Uh, there are people who operate with what's called FPV, first person view. Um, it's frowned upon by the real hardcore RC guys. You really should have eyes on the craft. Uh, Phil McNally, Captain 3D, who everybody knows, is also an avid micro aerial enthusiast. And uh, Phil does fly FPV, but he's got 3D FPV. And I don't know that many people other than Phil have really examined that thoroughly. I certainly think that the addition of depth perception would help the pilot operate the craft. But we've always got eyes on the bird. We don't, it, it has the ability to operate at great, great lengths over a kilometer away. And you can program GPS, waypoints, and all sorts of things. But for what we're doing, it's, it's not about sending it miles away. It's about, you know, the shot goes over here, comes around, and comes back there. So we keep eyes on the craft at all times. Yes? Oh, uh, I'll probably speak. I, uh, I attended the presentation um, about two weeks ago about a thing called the note card. And that actually, the platform uh -huh. had a downward looking camera, so you can send it to somewhere and it would stabilize itself in position, right? You know, XY position. Right. Yeah, XY. And uh, yeah. do your um, platforms have anything like that? Well, it's in the hover, and you can tell it to go there, and then sort of it'll look after itself. You can absolutely do that. The, this is an incredibly robust craft. It's got a 32-bit CPU. It's got GPS. It's got all kinds of incredible technology in it. So yes, it can absolutely do that. The camera can look down. We've got a three-axis gimbal, and you saw the types of camera moves that it's capable of. So yeah, that's certainly no problem. That's a separate camera positioning. Are you using the existing? Well, right now, we're focused primarily on flying payloads that are challenges for traditional microaerial systems. Um, we probably should talk more about that, but certainly other cameras can be attached. The FPV camera that's on our unit is strictly a monoscopic camera that is just a reference for the pilot. So that's the only additional camera beyond the picture camera that you would have on there. Yes? What, what are the sort of legal restrictions in terms of using a craft like this compared to a helicopter and uh, the classification of the between the two things, and is that going to change? It's an excellent question. I, I don't know the answer to that question outside of the United States, but I've been very, very involved with the Federal Aviation Administration, which is the body that regulates aircraft in the U.S. Uh, micro aerial craft are considered hobbyist toys, essentially, until you use them for commercial purposes. Currently in the United States, there is no FAA regulation uh, for the commercial operation of unmanned aerial vehicles. Therefore, operating one for commercial gain is a violation of federal law, but it's not specifically against the law. So you can't get arrested for it, but the FAA has fined one operator in the United States, I think in Illinois, $10,000. And just last week, a federal judge overturned that ruling freed this guy of the $10,000 burden and basically set the precedent that the FAA can't stop people from flying these craft commercially. Now, unfortunately, less than two days later, the FAA issued some new edict 
that puts it sort of back into limbo. But um, we are working very closely with the FAA, and the information that we're getting right now is that it will be regulated by 2015. Uh, I, Europe is a lot less restrictive, and most of these crafts are being developed in Europe. That's why we were kind of traveling the world to get the best parts. So it's, it's very new. And again, you know, our, our goal is to be, in the United States at least, at the cutting edge and the forefront with what the FAA is doing. So that when these crafts are certified and regulated, Aerocine will be among the first to operate under a federal license. So there's no rules about power lines or overcrowd? The rules right now apply specifically to hobbyist operating, and they are literally written as essentially be responsible, don't operate them near people, don't be a dummy. So recently in New York City, there was someone using a single rotor uh, remote control helicopter that decapitated himself in Central Park. So <laughs> permits for these crafts in New York City are sort of not available. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very gray area. It's a wild west right now. Any further questions? What kind of fuel do you use here? Excellent question. It is an electric helicopter and it is battery operated. So everything that we do to reduce the weight of the payload, for instance, if we went to carbon fiber dragons uh, and we've done some things where we're customizing Genlock boxes and things like that to eliminate cables, we've got one customization that's going to be going online next week that's eliminating 14 ounces, almost one full pound, just of cabling and, and things like that. So for every pound that we take off, that's additional battery power that can be added, additional flight time, et cetera. So if you don't want to shoot Epic, or if you don't need 3D, or if anything happens that makes the camera lighter, then the flight time increases and, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, yes? Uh, is it possible to rent the, in, in Europe this week? Oh, absolutely. The craft is avail available for hire worldwide. Of course, it comes with my crew. It's a very, very complicated vehicle to operate, and we would never send it out to someone unfamiliar or unqualified with it. But yes, it's available worldwide. So we, uh, we need the two people to follow the... There would be, there would be a pilot, yeah. a camera operator, yeah. and an aircraft technician. Okay. So it's three people. Three people. Coming from Los Angeles? Uh, New York. Uh, New York, OK. <laughs> One more question right here. Yeah, you sort of half answered the question there, because I was going to ask you about whether or not you were doing uh, rental stroke licensing or it was going to be a retail product. But given that you've, you've sort of answered that. In yeah. The world, yeah. You know, well, those of you that are familiar with micro aerial platforms will recognize that the craft is a commercial off-the-shelf vehicle, but it has undergone extensive modifications at Aerocine to be able to have the capabilities that it has. So it's not something that we intend to sell. We're building a fleet of them, and we're going to make them available worldwide for hire. Common interaxials, what minimum, maximum? Uh, the minimum interaxial is dictated right now by the width of the Red Epic, so it's a, a fixed interaxial at about five inches. Thank you, everyone. We are working on a beam splitter that will fit on it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I appreciate the questions and the time.